I have been on the job a very short time, and this is my first talk. And I, I will tell you that when I came into this job, I'd been doing talks like twice a week for Code for America, because that's what you do when you're running a nonprofit and you want exposure for it. Um, and coming into this job, I said, no talks. And Rick Weiss at White House said, no talks. Don't do talks. You don't have time for it, and you don't know what you're talking about yet. But <laughs> Steve um, asked me to do this. And I said, Rick, I think we need to do this one. Because uh, like Steve said, we knew each other back when he was starting GovLoop. That was 2008, right? Um, I started Code for America in 2009, partly because I could see all this energy that was starting to co cohere around this idea that we could change government. Um, and what I've seen over the past you know, couple of years, while I've been over in California building Code for America, is that there's a community here, and that's what David was talking about, that cares about government, um, and that is having an important and honest and open dialogue about what that means and what it means in your daily life and how you will help make it better. And so that's really what I'm here to talk about, sort of my experience that's brought, my, brought me here um, and uh, a little bit more advice, I think, along the lines of what Dave shared. So um, I said I'm new. This is, I counted last night. This is my 37th day in federal government. <laughs> Uh, if you count the weekends, it's 51, um, and I would count some of them. <laughs> there have been several weekends. Um, uh, um, but I'm thinking about one day in particular, which is just two days ago, Tuesday, my uh, 35th day. Um, Tuesdays are really good days for us on our team because the Presidential Innovation Fellows come together. Um, you probably know a little bit about them. Um, these are people who come in for short stints in government. They're chosen from this year over 2,100 applicants for the program, and the um, federal agencies uh, compete to get them and have them work uh, on projects in a lean startup sort of way. So they're going to get something ver done very quickly that can really you know, drive an enormous amount of momentum. So most of the time, a lot of them are in their agencies around DC, some of them off in Denver. But Tuesdays, we bring them all back together at GSA. We have a talk. Uh, we do a stand up. We just sort of share what's going on. Um, and this Tuesday, uh, I was actually like not just multitasking, I was like triple, quadruple tasking. I had to be on a phone call and I was talking to a couple people. You know when you're on the, the conference call but you're just on mute and you're not really listening? I was doing that. Um, it was actually a call about Code for America. Um, and uh, one of the fellows, a guy named Robert Reed, um, had said that he was able to demo uh, something that he, a project he had started. And I said, well, I really want to see that. You know, he hasn't been here that long. And so while I'm doing these three other things, I called these guys in. Um, Robert had um, gotten a bunch of data out of GSA about prices paid for certain commodities. I think this was actually laptops. Um, and he had built an amazing data, interactive data visualization uh, where you could look up you know, a particular kind of laptop that had been bought across government, and it would show you Kind of like, okay, we mentioned TED, so I'll bring it up. Like, remember the Hans Rosling TED talk where there's bubbles moving across the screen and it blows your mind? It wasn't quite that good, but it was pretty good. Uh, you know, bubbles the, the size of each buy and across the spectrum of how much um, various agencies had paid for these particular laptops. And I, you know, I did the math. That was Robert's 27th day in government, and he had done this. Um, and I know there's probably people in the room who, you know, not due to any of their own fault, but on their 27th day, we're still struggling to get their email set up or something like that. Um, but I, I, thought that was, um, I thought that was really remarkable. And um, it made me feel kind of at home, because um, that's the kind of thing that I started to see kind of year after year at Code for America, this unbelievable ability for somebody to walk in and go, I am just going to do this. <laughs> I know there are a lot of barriers in the way, and I know there's a lot I need to learn. But uh, the way I'm going to learn is by doing, and it's pretty remarkable. Um, I found this out certainly, um, I think, the most uh, compelling way the first year of Code for America. There were a bunch of projects going in, and this was not one that happened right early in the process. Um, but it's a similar program, Code for America, Steve mentioned it. It's, um, but our fellows come and work with city government, so we're working at the local level, and they do a year, and they're embedded in their city. So it's a little bit different, but it's not that different. Um, we had a team our first year working in the city of Boston. Really, really great experience. They did a number of fantastic things. But one in particular, in the middle of the year, the mayor came to the fellows and said, I know you guys are working on your projects, but I have something that's kind of an emergency. Uh, 
there, they had changed the rules about how kids got assigned to public schools in Boston. And uh, it was really, really confusing. They'd actually done a good thing. They were trying to make more walkable neighborhoods. So they'd said basically if you live in a you know, 1.5 mile walk shed from a school, you're eligible to go to that one. But there were some other rules around it and you really couldn't figure it out. And the press had started slamming the city about how difficult this process was. And he said, can somebody please work on an interactive you know, web app that, can, that you know, will, will help you figure this out? So one of the fellows went off of the current project and went away. He got a little help from some of the other fellows. And in two and a half months, he put up, and I'm sorry I didn't do slides today, but you can imagine it or go look it up, uh, discoverbps.org. Um, the Wi-Fi here is good. You can go look at it. Basically, it's a website you go on. You type in your address, the age of your kid, whether the kid has siblings in another Boston public school, and you hit return, and it tells you which schools on a lovely map you are eligible to attend. And it went from a process that had involved a 28-page printed brochure with five-point type that you could read all the way through and still not know which school your kid could attend um, to about five seconds on the web. Um, of course, then you're going to you know, read through the descriptions of these schools and look at the comments other parents have made and make a real decision. Um, but it really fundamentally trans transformed the relationship that the school district was having with the parents. Um, and it was interesting in a number of ways. This was my uh, introduction, and I'm sorry to all you people who, for whom this has you know, been uh, you know, the lingua, lingua franca for a long time. This was my introduction to the word procurement, because our partners uh, in the city government in Boston told us that if that project had gone through normal channels and normal procurement, I'm a big fan of procurement, by the way, don't get me wrong, um, that would have taken at least two years, and it would have taken about $2 million. And so in that context, and I think we all think about money, especially in this era, it is really hard as a taxpayer to think about the fact that it would cost that, that much when this one guy, Joel Mahoney, and a couple other people helping out did it in, you know, in, in two months. Um, but in that case, what was really more important was the speed. The, the mayor needed to be able to go to the people of Boston and say, we can fix this. Mayor Menino calls himself the new urban mechanic, by the way, which is very cute. And they have this office of new urban mechanics there because he believes he can fix it, anything, and it's great. So the speed is really important. It's important to building trust and faith with, with citizens. And I realize this is a local level example. But the other thing that was really important about that app, um, not just the speed and the cost, um, but it was how that app looked and how it felt and how it worked. And when I saw it for the first time, it reminded me of a moment several months before when we had taken the first Code for America fellows together. Um, it was their first day. We did not know, oops, sorry, we did not know what we were doing. Um, I do not exaggerate. We were doing the best that we could in a new program. And we had all these great people who'd come together and said, yes, on faith, I am going to uh, do this program with you. Uh, and we sat them down and we asked them, why are you here? You could be doing anything else. And by the way, I would ask you guys that question too. You're here for a reason. You chose this. Um, and one of the fellows, a guy named Scott Silverman, who had come over from Apple, said, I'm here because I believe that interfaces to government can be simple, beautiful, and easy to use. And when we think about that notion of trust and faith in government, that's such an important concept, the way that people react when we provide interfaces to government that are simple, beautiful, and easy to use. Um, so I don't remotely believe that these projects that sort of stand out in terms of speed and cost and quality come only from fellows. I just want to be clear. I know that these come from all areas of government. It happens to be that I went from running a fellowship program to running another fellowship program. Um, but uh, they do stand out in certain ways. And it's easy to look at those things and say, that shouldn't work. Like the math of government means that like, that just doesn't add up. Uh, makes you think about like the bumblebee. I think they've figured this out, but they used to say that the bumblebee is like not physically able to fly. They couldn't figure it out. The body was too big and the wings were too small. But it does fly. And if you think about something like Wikipedia, someone said to you 10 years ago, a whole bunch of random people are going to, in an unmanaged way, in their spare time, create a resource that is comprehensive, timely, accurate, and available free to everybody on the web. Um, you would have said, nuh uh, <laughs> that doesn't work, but it does work. And that's the society that we live in right now, and that's the expectation and the experience 
that people come to government with. And so that's the bar, and we need to try to meet that bar. And that is part, not all, but part of my agenda here uh, in government this year. So um, let me see, where am I? Uh, you should also really see these fellowships in some way as a hack on the system, right? So um, there was a procurement, to be clear. There was a procurement of the fellows themselves. Um, and then you procure the fellows and you give them sort of a long leash. Um, and I think many people wish they had a longer leash in government to do what they want to do. Um, and then they have the ability to make things um, that are generally hard in government look easy. So we just want to you know, recognize that that's what's going on here. It's really a hack. So um, are those things really hard or do we just make them harder than they need to be in government? It's a good question to ask. Um, there's a programming language called Perl. I don't use it, don't get me wrong. I just hang out with programmers. I am not a programmer. Um, but I have heard this before. The tagline for Perl was, Perl makes easy things easy and hard things possible. So it reminds me of one of the things our city government partners said about a Code for America fellows one year. He said, the fellows don't know that what they're doing is impossible, so they just do it and they deliver. Um, so we want to make easy things easy and hard things possible. And I know that some people say that in government, easy things are hard and hard things are impossible. <laughs> um, but when they say that, I have to say back, excuse me, really? It was easy to put a man on the moon? It was easy, really, to create uh, our federal interstate highway system? It was not easy to put satellites up in space that now talk to our cell phones and tell us that the JW Marriott is on the corner of 14th, and that the you know, street goes the, wrong, the other way. You know, these things that, that inform our daily lives. And it, it's not easy to do things like helping a community recover when a tornado literally um, turns their town into rubble. These are not easy things, and these are the things that government does. Um, and I think that uh, just gets back to me to the value of government. We pool our resources together to do the things that we can't do apart. And everyone who has heard me or Tim O'Reilly talk, we always say this, and I know it's Thomas Jefferson and it's Tim O'Reilly and it's, um, I think, Elizabeth Warren and Barney Frank all say this, but government is what we do together. Everyone has their own variation on that. Um, and that's the value of government in two senses of the word. In other words, it's the value that government brings and it's reflective of the values of government. When we talk about I have values or we together have values, it's the value of pooling our resources and saying we can't do this alone. Um, but the point of the experiments like Robert Reed, the, the fellow did, or the other Code for America fellows, is to make the easy things easy so that we can do the hard things. So we should be tackling the hard things every day. And sometimes those things are helping a community that's been devastated um, by a disaster. Um, but daily, some of the hardest stuff is actually just changing government and bringing it into the current century that, so that people can have trust and faith in it. Um, so I mentioned that uh, this is my 37th day in government. Um, but I want to talk about another day, not just last Tuesday. And that was my third day in government. Um, I spent two days in orientation out at my home agency, in which, at which time I thought, wow, this government thing moves very, very slowly. <laughs> and then I got detailed over to the White House, and I, uh, my boss, Todd Park, said, come on, we're ta I'm taking you out to lunch. And he said, turns out that the president has gotten very excited about this idea of bringing government into the 21st century. He wants to call his cabinet together and ask them to contribute to a second term management agenda about this. And he wants to uh, also have, uh, give a speech about this topic. And so you're the deputy innovation, uh, deputy CTO for government innovation, so get going. <laughs> and it was like, um, kind of like when you're at the amusement park and you get on the ride and at like first you're in the part of the track where the thing is going very slowly and you don't realize that then you hit the fast track and you get whiplash and you haven't even, you know, buckled your seat belt yet. Um, so it was like going from very slow to incredibly fast and uh, it's been quite a wild ride. Um, but on uh, July 8th, um, which I was my 26th day in government, so I'm going to count this whole year. Um, after just an enormous amount of work by an enormous amount of people um, who I am proud to count as one, um, just a great, great team, the president did in fact call his cabinet together 
um, and did this speech and um, rolled out this idea of his second term management agenda being about 21st century government. Um, I sat in that room, you know, listening to the man talk about the things that get me up in the morning, the things that I really care about, um, the goals that uh, drove me to quit my job and start Code for America, the goals that drove me to leave California and come out to DC for some time. Um, these are things I just absolutely geek over, and those words, the words about the things I care about, in fact, sometimes the very same words we used were coming out of the president's mouth. So it was just, it was a wonderful moment. Um, he taught, if you haven't seen this speech, by the way, of course, it's up on the White House blog, date of July 8th. Um, please watch the video. He did a great job. Um, so the president talked about how to use technology to allow citizens to participate in their democracy um, and to bring government built largely in the 20th century into the 21st century. Um, of course, he talked about data to cut spending in government, um, particularly our wonderful CIO, uh, Steve Van Rokel, has a project called Portfolio Stat, which has already saved the federal government $2.5 billion. And I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, he, of course, talked about data.gov and its 75,000 data sets. Um, and now you should all know that there is next.data.gov, um, which is pretty amazing. It's sort of in preview right now. If you care about government data and care about its ability to generate value for you and for the American people, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at next.data.gov. Um, he also talked about um, not one, but two projects that the Presidential Innovation Fellows had um, already created, which was very exciting for our team over uh, at White House and GSA. Um, one was RFPEZ, which is an amazing program that um, uh, invites, uh, in a very simple, clear, sort of simple, beautiful, easy to use interface, invites small businesses, uh, particularly the, um, smaller web shops, for instance, um, into the government contracting process. They did a uh, pilot at the end of the last Presidential Innovation Fellows uh, cycle where um, they put the same bid up on RFPEZ and Fed BizOps. <laughs> The price, the bids that came in through RFPEZ were 30% lower, and they had something like 170 new companies wanting to work with government that didn't, would not have come in through another channel. So it was very exciting. Um, he also spoke the words My USA, a great project out of, uh, uh, again, the first round PIFs run by Greg Gershman. This is um, a, a little web app and um, an API that helps the customer experience that citizens and businesses have on government websites. It just helps it make a little bit better filling in forms, it actually stores personally identified information. If it sounds like something that any of you in this room um, would want to use in your work, I would please encourage you to ask me or Ariane Gallagher, where are you? Right up here after um, this event, because it's just a, it's a really great project. Um, so this is all really exciting. Um, it's really inspiring um, that our president understands so much what this challenge is, really I think at a gut level. Um, and it's also really stressful because now we have to make his words real. We have to rise to the challenge. And when I say we, I don't mean me and Ariane, I mean everybody in this room, uh, literally. I, I, Todd Park, if you've ever heard him speak, I know he, heard, he spoke last year. He uses the word literally all the time and sometimes it's not literally. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say literally, literally all of us in the room. Um, he has so much enthusiasm, it just is incredibly inspiring. Um, so um, it is true that there is this process now that is going through uh, the channels of government to create the 24, uh, I'm sorry, it's now called the second term management agenda, which is really focused around 21st century government. And I hope that all of you get to touch it in some way through those formal channels. Um, but the thing I really want you to know when it comes your way, or if it doesn't come your way um, directly, is that you do not need the permission of the White House or any of anybody else to contribute to this agenda. Um, there's certainly going to be some projects that are bubbled up through the agencies that are chosen to be sort of projects that um, uh, the White House and OMB will, will help shepherd and, and, and create as priorities. But there's also going to be a mechanism for the people who really know how to move this agenda forward to do what they want to do and to get that work recognized and, um, and shown a spotlight on. And I think that you people should all consider that this is part, that, that this, that part is speaking directly to anybody who cares about government. So 
Um, please think about that. Um, I should add that the um, management agenda is really focused around three things. Efficiency of government, effectiveness of government, and uh, economic growth. And if you think about all that data that is getting out there and all the businesses that are being built on it, that's part of what we mean by economic growth. Um, and I think if the patterns hold from what I've seen over the past couple of years, it will be the projects that surprise people that didn't necessarily um, you know, become one of the top priorities that get the most attention and most importantly have the biggest impact. Um, so there is a big strategic plan. I'm very excited about that. Um, but if any of you have ever been in a co-working space in the past year or two, you've probably seen that sign that says, I have a strategic plan. It's called doing things. <laughs> that works too. Um, so if I can succeed in enrolling all of you guys in this giant agenda, um, then you're all going to need to be very effective change agents. Um, and I have the suspicion I am completely preaching to the choir here. Um, but if you'll indulge me for a minute, um, I'd like to just give you a couple pieces of advice about how to be a change agent. Um, and then afterwards, you can tell me what the real deal is, because I would like to learn from you too. My first thing just is that you have to, if you, if you feel like you want to change government, you have to think of it like a person. You can't change it unless you really love it. Always come from a place of loving government. And that means holding two contradictory ideas in your head at the same time. I love something and yet I want to change it. But um, that is the sign of strong thinking. You have to do that. You also have to hold the idea of chaos and control together. You have to hold the idea of big government and small government. Um, and you have to hold that idea of loving government and wanting to change it. But if you don't come from that place of love, I don't think it's as effective. Um, of course, um, respect the people, but change the system. Um, at Code for America, really often, um, the fellows would come in and they would need data uh, to do their applications. And somebody would say, mm, you're not getting that data. And so you, you're tempted to sort of blame the person who won't give you the data. But if you remember that the person who is not giving you that data is doing it because they believe they're protecting the taxpayers and that's what the taxpayers are doing, are paying them to do, you realize that you have some common ground. You have the same intentions, you're just looking at it from a different perspective. So just remember that. Always come from a place of empathy for the people. Um, go to the source. Um, you know, in programming we talk about the source code. You need to look at the basic thing that is operating here and get beyond the, the other layers on top of it. If someone tells you you can't do something and it seems like maybe that's not quite right, it might not be that the law or the regulation actually prevents you. It may be that there's been memos written and interpretations of that that keep you from doing it. And there have been, I know you guys are hearing from Brian Sivak tomorrow. Hopefully he'll talk about that more. He's the master of this. He's fantastic. But if you really go do your homework, go look at the law or the regulation and see if it really says what they say it's gonna, it, it says. Um, of course, and it's not surprising, befriend the geeks and channel your inner geek. <laughs> Um, it used to be that you had to be friends with the geeks because you, they were going to get you like, you know, a loner laptop or like, you know, you get to be uh, in the pilot for the iPhone. So it was really about just access to technology. Um, my friend Tom Steinberg, who runs my society in the UK, has a, has a line, and I hope I get it here. What good governance and good society look like are inextricably tied to an understanding of the digital. It's not just about your laptop anymore. We can't run the country if we can't do good digital. So you need to, not, you don't have to be a programmer, but you do need to not be afraid of the digital, and I imagine none of you are here. Um, but, but make friends with those geeks. Um, remember who's the boss. The boss is uh, always the users. It's always the citizens or whoever you're trying to work with. I won't go into that more. I had a good um, slide on it. <clears throat> And the last, I think, the most important thing, and this is to follow on to what David said, use your network to hold yourself to a higher standard. So everybody talks about building a network and using that network to further your career. Um, I think there's a great line that it resonates a lot with me. Um, the time to build your network is before you need it. I found that out when I founded Code for America. I bet you did too, Steve. Um, if you build a network in order to immediately sort of, uh, you know, harvest the value of it, um, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> build a network because you have shared values and you have things in common and later on that network will do something for you. But um, 
they're finding out this thing now about MOOCs. You guys know the ma massive online open courses. Um, in a MOOC, people aren't so much playing to the teacher because you know there's MOOCs with 30,000 participants. So you're really playing to the other students. And they've found actually that people hold themselves to a higher standard when they're playing to their peers. And I think that works here too because you know, I mean, we see this in, in uh, with the fellows a lot when they do the thing that they were at. You know, sorry, that's my phone. Um, when you uh, when they do when you do the thing that looks like magic and it took you a month and you're supposed to be there for a year you go great I did it that's awesome you've met somebody's expectations but the guy next to you your peer in the fellowship knows you can do a whole lot more and so we ask the fellows and I would ask you guys to remember you know what's possible outside the walls of government and you know what you're capable of so use your network to hold each other to a higher standard. Um, I know that it is important to use the network for your career as well, but I'm telling you, if you use it to um, inspire each other to do great things, the career will take care of itself. I guarantee it. I'm sure you've all seen this, and I'm really um, sort of um, preaching to the choir. Um, I know this is a young crowd, but I was, as I was coming up here, I was thinking about what to say. I was, looking back through my emails with Steve over time and reminded that um, his, his email, Mr. Founder at GovLoop.com, actually has a kid now. And uh, I have a kid too. And I think once you have a kid, you really start thinking about the meaning of your career, not just being about, you know, get it rising through the ranks, but about what you're going to leave your kid and what shape we're going to leave this country and this world in. Um, speaking of uh, Founder at GovLoop.com, um, I wanted to end on that word founder. Um, I come from Silicon Valley where that means like everybody's a founder, it's very um, all about the entrepreneurs and everybody's founded a company here and there, um, sometimes many. Um, but uh, the one founder in particular, a guy named Jack, uh, Jack Dorsey, um, you're gonna hear from Johnny Dorsey later, this is different, where's Johnny? <laughs> um, actually notice the resonance in this word because out here, uh, I had dinner at Founding Farmers last night. Founding is about our founding fathers when you're out here. But there's something in common there. And he noted that in a talk he gave about a year and a half ago that just you know, gave chills up and down my spine because he's calling out something that I think is really important. Um, he's talking about how, he was originally talking about how when he started uh, Twitter and then Square, he was the founder, but all these people came in and were sort of his co-founders over time, not the ones that he, they're credited with. But he, has this, he had a picture up of our founding fathers, and he said, our founding fathers had a lot of good ideas, but one great one, a more perfect union. They had the realization that they weren't going to get everything right the first time around, that a lot of the work had to be unfinished, undefined, unpainted, open to the future, that there would not be one founding moment of this country, but in fact many. So as Steve or any other entrepreneur will tell you, no one gives you permission to be a founder, uh, and no one makes it safe. You decide to take that risk because you believe it's important. Uh, and when it comes to taking risks and founding something, the founders of our country uh, risked it all. Now, I don't think you need to risk your life, um, but you can honor what they put on the line and what many subsequent founders of this country have put on the line by remembering that they created this nation to be open to the future and that it's our jobs to make sure it gets there. So my ask to you is to make today and many days to come your own founding moments. And thank you very much for having me.